Well, good morning, church family. Happy Resurrection Sunday to each of you. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to the Gospel of John, John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I'm feeling a little stiff this morning. I, I, I feel like one of those knights in all their armor. I realized when I drove over this morning, I'm driving like this, like... <laughs> Oh, man, it's tough to be a man. Yeah, that's just... On the outside, I might be wearing a suit, but on the inside, I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt right now. Oh. Oh. John chapter 20. <clears throat> Let's just pray before we dig in here. God, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that in this crazy, divided world, there is this standard of truth that our creator has not only given to us, but blessed us to understand. And Lord, we thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit that comes to teach us, to guide us, to lead us, to convict us. And I pray, God, that you would do just that in each of our hearts this morning. That, God, we would not leave this place the same way we came in. But that our hearts, our souls, our spirits, our very lives would be changed because we have met with the risen Lord. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 20, in this portion of Scripture, uh, Jesus has now died on the cross. He has risen from the grave You'll remember that just before chapter 20, Mary has gone to the tomb and found that it was empty, and she runs back and talks to a couple of the disciples, and they run to the tomb, and they find that it's empty. And, and, and the scripture then tells us that the disciples, at that moment, simply returned home. They returned home after finding uh, this tomb no longer occupied. Have you ever been to a funeral? Maybe you, you've been to attend the funeral of a loved one, a, a mom, a dad, a spouse, and uh, you get home after the long day of calling hours or the funeral itself. And, and what do we do? We, we lay out on the couch or we sit in our favorite chair and the emotions that overwhelm us can be confusion, it can be that we're disillusioned, it could be that we're stumped, it could just be that we're really sad, it could even mean that we're fearful, like we've lost a loved one. And life at that moment seems like it will never be the same. Beginning at verse 19 of this 20th chapter, it says this, on the evening of that day, so this is... Resurrection Sunday evening, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. 
And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and he showed them his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. He says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am now sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. This is a very very powerful moment in the scriptures. Because here we see the recently put to death Son of God converse, communicate, relate with men who had actually witnessed the nails going through his hands and his feet. In fact, if this exchange that we just read here in God's Word, if this exchange had not been recorded for us here in the Bible, we would have no certainty of life after death. I say that because death is the result of sin. And death would have won out. Death and sin would have won the day had Jesus stayed in that grave. He would have been overcome with sin and died and just remained there like people do in any grave. And if that were the case, you need to understand that you and I would have only this life and nothing beyond. This is it. If we did not have the passage that we have just read from God's word this morning. This is a super important exchange because these verses prove to us the beauty and the glory and the certainty of a Savior, this Jesus, who is now alive again. This morning, let's just note three things that, that, that surface here that are applicable to our lives today. How did this risen Savior act? What did he say to his loved ones? And what does he have to offer to you and I this morning as the risen Savior? First, how did the risen Savior act? Look at verse 19 again. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. So not only have these disciples lost their leader to death, but they're fearful because the Jews who put Jesus to death or brought him to that place of being put to death They're out on a roll now looking for these men and women who were followers of this Jesus. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of confusion. And so this is the evening of the Sunday again that Jesus has risen from the dead. That morning Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene by the grave, but now he is appearing to all of the disciples in this room. Notice three things here. The doors to that room are secured. 
the scripture tells us. The scripture also tells us that the disciples are afraid and Jesus supernaturally comes to them and stands in their company. Now those facts tell us some things that we can know about the risen Christ who is longing to deal with us today as he longed to deal with the disciples then. First, let's remember the doors were secured. The disciples are locked in this room. They've secured themselves in a protected place, and yet Jesus comes into their space regardless of their security and their hidden refuge. He doesn't have to knock. He doesn't have to ring the bell. He doesn't have to wait outside. He simply appears in their midst. It says Jesus came and stood among them. And then verse 20 says, he showed them his hands and his side. In another gospel, it says this. Jesus says in regards to this visit, he says, go ahead and touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Now, take a step back and think about this for a moment. Here is the resurrected Jesus, a divine man. The resurrected Jesus, still as a man, but also in divine nature. That's how he could just appear in the room. And he makes himself known to them. In spite of the Closed, secured, locked doors. Why is that important for us this morning? Well, it's important because this is what that means for us here today. Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, can go where no one else can go. As I've said to you before, Jesus can go into the places of your heart where no counselor can go. Jesus can go where no doctor can go. He can go where no lover can go. Jesus can reach you, and he can reach you at any time, in any place, any situation. Because there's no place, there's no situation, There's no past where Jesus can't come and penetrate and speak into your hurts, your habits, or your hang-ups. You see, you have to understand that this risen Jesus is not confined or limited by space or time or matter. This is the Son of God. And so Jesus' resurrection from the dead allows him to do what no other man could ever do. There's a lot of complex layers to our lives, isn't there? And those layers hold all kinds of secrets and hurts and guilt and shame. And what I want you to understand this morning is that Jesus is familiar to each and every one of those places in your heart. Now, you... You might be sitting there and you're thinking, but Pastor, you don't don't understand. You know, we always think we're worse than the person sitting next to us or, 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 or worse than the person 
sitting elsewhere. And it's easy for us to say, but I'm so sinful. My, my, my faith is so weak. I, 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 I'm not even sure I believe. And here's what we need to remind ourselves of. One of the characteristics, one of the attributes of Jesus is that he is self-existent, which means Jesus, the Son of God, does not need anything from you or me. Jesus, in this situation, shows up behind the locked doors of our hearts because he wants to offer himself to us. In fact, it says in Jeremiah 16, he says, For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face. My eyes are on all their ways. And then in Hebrews 4, it says, Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and secure, exposed before his eyes. So understand the news of the gospel this morning. When you listen to these words, that can make you fearful. Oh, my word, there's somebody who knows what I did last night. Or it can make you hopeful. In my pain and suffering, Jesus knows right where I'm at, at this moment. Secured doors and locked places in our lives are not impassable for Jesus. Second of all, notice again, that they were afraid. It says in 19, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. And for these disciples, their leader, this Jesus, he's just two days earlier been tortured before them. He's been crucified as a threat to Caesar, who was the fierce Roman leader. The Jewish leaders just we're hyper focused on getting him onto a cross and dead. And, 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 and so the fear that these men and women are feeling is quite honestly understandable. And yet, I want you to understand that it's into that fear, it's into that place of anxiety and worry that Jesus comes in. I think I've told you before that there are times in my life when I can be the poster boy for anxiety, worry, depression. Those are just things that I struggle with. But how about you? Are, are there ever any things that happen in your life that surface some fear, some anxiety. Maybe some of you, like myself, you, you, you watch some of the news in today's world and that can just throw you off a bit. Or do you ever find yourself saying in your head, well, what if? What if I get that disease? What if I fail this class? What if my job closes its doors unexpectedly. What if I don't have enough money? What if my kids walk away from Jesus? What if I walk away? What if? And what Jesus is saying to us here is this, I come to my own even when they're fearful even when they're afraid. Jesus is saying, I, I'm not afraid of their fear. 
I don't wait for them to, to get their act together. I don't wait for them to somehow muster up enough strength to just kind of put the fear under the carpet. Then I'll come to them. I don't wait for them to have enough fear to overcome fear. I come to help them have enough faith to overcome the fear that they're feeling. You see, sometimes we stay away from Jesus because we know we shouldn't be fearful of what we're walking through in our journey. How many of us live our lives behind the prison doors of worry and fear and anxiety, not realizing, not believing, not having the confidence that Jesus can meet us in the midst of all of our what-ifs. You see, for these disciples, their eyes often got fixed on what others could do to help them. And maybe your eyes are fixed on what could happen, what might happen, what possibly could happen if life were trying to kind of just to get out of control on us. But our Heavenly Father reminds us the care that He has for His children. And that even in our weaknesses, our worries, our fears, He's there for us. In fact, it says in the book of Isaiah, fear not. Fear not. For I have redeemed you. I've summoned you by name. You are mine. My dad, when I was young, used to have this saying, as an anxious kid, he, he, he knew that that kind of just plagued me. And and my dad would wrap his arms around me and he would say, Don, it's going to be okay. And that would just bring great comfort. And that's what our Heavenly Father is saying to us through the truth of his word. You're my children. You don't need to fear. I'm the God of the universe. Nothing is going to happen that's out of my control. Thirdly, we see here that Jesus comes to them and then stands right there in their presence. It says in 19, again, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. The, the, the point to this is that Jesus came right into the middle of their little gathering. Jesus didn't come to the edge. He, he, he didn't call out through the wall. He, he, he didn't, like, get on the ring camera and say, I'm out here. I know you're in there, but I got something I want to share with you. God did not deal with them. Hear me. God did not deal with them as a distant deity. He wasn't playing games with them. He wasn't toying with their faith. Jesus wanted his children really, really, really understand his character, his person, his glory, and his nature. Just think of the reaction when Jesus arrives unannounced. In fact, he's real enough that the, there are other scriptures that tell us that he comes in and he actually asks them for food. That's the human side of this Jesus who's come to earth. But he's divine enough that he didn't have to enter through any door. 
And this is their Jesus. This is their friend. This is the loved one that they thought they would never, ever see again. Imagine the emotions <laughs> at that point. I mean, for me, I think I'm fearful and confused before. But now Jesus like, is standing looking at me eye to eye. Now I'm like really shaken. Like, what is this all about? Is it ever hard for you to imagine being in the very presence of Jesus? Just, just think about that for a moment. Is it hard for you to think that Jesus is able, or better yet, even wants to come near to you? Maybe that kind of insecurity comes from our past, our failures, our guilt, maybe our pride. I mean, it's hard to imagine that the God of the universe wants to, to, to come close to us, but isn't that what we're witnessing right here in these scriptures? The whole Easter story is about Jesus drawing near to us. Not coming near to people, not coming just to people who have got it all together. No, Jesus comes into the midst of their presence, and he's come, he says, to seek and save those who recognize that they're lost and in need of a rescuer. I've thought a lot about that this week. Why are some of us in our reality, wherever we might be in our journey through this life, why are we afraid to interact with this Jesus? You know, I find today that people often dismiss Jesus and all that he is and his love really for three basic reasons. There are many more, but I find as a pastor three reasons that people will seem to give me over and over as why they dismiss Jesus. One, they'll say, I'm just not good enough. Two, they'll say, I I'm afraid that Jesus will ruin my fun. Three, Many people will say, what would my friends think of me? What would happen if my friends witnessed a radical transformation in my life? What would my spouse think? What would my family think? What would my friends think? Those are real life issues. Questions that, that we wrestle with, every one of us, from time to time. But fortunately, in God's word, he dispels every one of those self-lies that we feed to ourselves. First, you know, Jesus rescues us not because of our merits, not because of our deeds, not because of what we have done or haven't done, God rescues us because of his love and the grace that he wants to share with us. Remember what I said, he's self-existent. He doesn't need you. He wants you. It says in Titus chapter 3, but when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, that's what we're talking about this morning, when it appeared, he saved us. Hear this, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Amen. 
If you were to stand before Jesus this morning, and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my kingdom? If your answer is anything beyond or more than because Jesus is my righteousness, if you answer in any other way, you're a lost person. Because our deeds, our works, do not rescue us from our sin. Secondly, Jesus doesn't come to steal our fun, which is here today and often gone tomorrow. Rather, Jesus came to offer a joy that isn't just for today, but it's for all eternity, which means it will never end. We say this all the time around here. All of us look for satisfaction and joy in things, right? A nicer home, a better car, new clothes, a better relationship, a little upgrade on this or that. But every one of us would agree that when that has happened, when that's become a reality in our life, after a few weeks, after a bit of time, what happens? That thing that we've gone after, it doesn't satisfy us. It doesn't satisfy our hearts. And so what do we want? We want something more. It's a sick, vicious cycle that we find ourselves in. And it's something I, I have to remind myself of every day. When I say, boy, would I like to have that? Or, boy, does that look nice? Yeah. It might bring some fun. It might bring some satisfaction for a short time. But then life goes on. It says in Romans 15, may the God of hope or the God of certainty fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So that, watch this, so that you may overflow with hope or certainty by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the reason we get so caught up in things in this world and going after things in this world is because we're living for this world. And we forget, we forget that this is just a little piece of time that we're passing through. There's all of eternity to come. And that's why Jesus says, is your focus on this world and the things of this world, or is your focus on my kingdom and the things to come for all of eternity? you got to wrestle with that. I have to wrestle with that. Because this urge to have more things, that urge will never be broken as long as this world is your home, and that's all it is. When you recognize that eternity with Jesus is your ultimate home, now everything changes. Now everything focuses. You know what that is? You know what that means? Whatever I have, I just want to share with you. I just want to, I just want to enjoy whatever I have with you, and I want to enjoy what you have for me. Doesn't that bring fulfillment to us? Well, lastly, it's kind of ironic, but the fear that we often have of what our friends would think, it, it, it's, it's just interesting. Um, what, 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 what would my buddies at work think if Jesus was allowed to now be the ruler of my life. Now, that's not a big deal for me because I work with my wife. <laughs> Just gonna be real with you. Going to work today, Linda. Pray for me. 
know. I've been in the work world where most of you live your lives. And I've labored alongside of others who don't know Jesus. And, and, and ironically, what I've come to recognize is the people that I fear would maybe turn their back on me if I were to let Jesus be who Jesus really is. The ironic thing is they're looking for the same thing. They just don't want to come out and say it. But here's the other ironic thing. Once you man up or woman up, if there's such a term, and, and, and you share this Jesus and what he's done in your life and, and what he's doing in your life, when, when you start to share that with them, you know what? Their pride begins to break down because their heart's longing for the same thing that your heart was longing for. It's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing to be in the kingdom of Jesus because life works. Life works when Jesus is all, all that he desires to be in our lives. Notice one last thing here. Jesus twice says in verse 19 and 21, he says, peace be with you. That was kind of a common term back then. Peace be with you. Let's remember that the opposite of peace is conflict. And you see, this is important for us to understand because conflict is pretty, it holds a pretty high value and place in most of our lives. But Jesus didn't come into the world and die and rise again to ruin your life or to cause more conflict in your life. He came to rescue you from this life. And we can see here, uh, what we can see here is that he saves us from ruin, ruining our lives with what we think is best by now coming into our lives and offering us shalom, peace, wholeness. You see, before Jesus says anything about power, before, anything, before Jesus says anything about purpose, he wants these disciples to understand that he's come to establish peace in their lives. Peace with God the Father, peace within their hearts, and peace with one another. This is where a lot of us get this gospel message mixed up. Because we don't initiate peace with Jesus by our actions, but rather Jesus initiates peace with us. I want to drive that home over and over again to you. It's not by what you do or don't do. It's by receiving what Jesus has done for you on the cross. And Jesus on the cross died as our substitute. In other words, he took your sin, he took my sin, he took the sins of the world upon himself as the Son of God, and he became the sacrifice acceptable to the Father. He shed his own lifeblood to appease God the Father. Now again, if that's where the story ended, who cares? But he rose again. Which means he overcame sin and he overcame death and now he's saying to us this morning, this is what I want to offer you just like he was offering the disciples on that day. You say, well, pastor, how do, I, how do I make this connection? Like, I like what you're saying, I like what the scripture's saying, but how do I cross over that bridge? You know, the beauty of the gospel is its simplicity. 
And it comes down to this. In my sin, in recognition of who I really am in my heart, wicked, evil, sinful, I come humbly to Jesus and I say, Jesus, I, I'm everything that I ought not to be in your presence. But I put my trust in what you did on the cross, paying in full for my sin. And I simply receive your forgiveness. And because you rose from the dead, you have promised that because now I'm your child, I too will rise again with you after this world. And we will spend all of eternity together with him. That's the Easter message. That's the beauty of the risen Christ. That's the glory of the risen Savior. That he's for you and not against you. Let's pray. If there's anyone here this morning that's never crossed that line, that spiritual line, and put their trust and their faith in Christ as Savior, this morning, on this Easter morning, I would invite you in your heart just to cry out to Jesus. Jesus, I need you. I recognize my sin causes a separation, a chasm between myself and you. And I need you to be my rescuer, my savior. Would you come and forgive me? Would you cleanse me from all my sin? Would you make me one of your children? From this day forward, would you be the leader of my life? Would you give me a longing to be in the truth of your word so that I can grow in my knowledge of you, so that I can live my life with purpose for you. Would you cry out to Jesus this morning so that that would become a reality in your life? Lord, take these words of your truth. Make them be penetrated into our hearts that we might find you to be our anchor in the storm of this life. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.